Oh, greetings. Welcome to 221B Baker Street, the address of the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. That's him over there with the pipe. I'm Dr. John Watson, Holmes' dedicated colleague. The video cassette you're watching contains 10 of our most exciting adventures devised especially for this game. First, you need a writing instrument. If you don't have a pen or pencil, stop the tape and get one. Good. Now, each player should take a sheet from the detective checklist pad. All your writing can be done on the front and back of this sheet. Now, shortly after each adventure begins, a list of lettered items will appear on the screen. These are the items you need to solve in order to win. For example, the following graphic may appear, instructing you to identify A, the killer, B, the motive, C, the weapon. When these items appear, write them on your checklist sheet, either under solutions or under miscellaneous notes. When you come to a spot on the tape which says, stop tape, take two turns, who is instructed? A turn consists of picking up either a location card, a badge card, or a key card. Use your detective checklist sheet to keep track of the locations you've been to and the clues you've picked up. <clears throat> On the back of your checklist sheet, you'll see a section marked Quick Quiz Answers with spaces numbered one to four. During some of the adventures, I will ask you quick quiz questions and give you 10 seconds to write your answer. If you answer correctly, you'll earn a bonus turn. The quick quiz questions may come at any time, so stay alert and be ready to write. Each adventure on this tape contains a prologue, three chapters, and an epilogue. After viewing chapter three, the tape will say, stop tape. Take turns until the player announces correct solution. Good luck. At this point, a turn will consist of either picking a card or replaying a scene from the adventure. You may replay any scene, but no more than one scene at a time. Just be careful not to play the epilogue until you wish to see the solution. When you think you have solved all the items that need to be solved, you may, when it is your turn, announce the solution. You then check the solution in the answer booklet to see if you are correct. If you are, you win the game. You may play the epilogue and let the other players marvel at your deductive skills. If any of your answers are incorrect, however, you must close the booklet immediately and you're out of the game. The others then continue playing without you until there is a winner. I'll help you out during each adventure, so there's nothing else you really need to know. Just let the tape keep playing until I tell you otherwise. If you're still unclear about anything, however, you may stop the tape now and check the rule booklet. Or rewind the tape and review this opening sequence. <laughs> oh, well, I see you're still here. Jolly good. I say, Holmes, it's time. Splendid, Watson. The game is afoot. years as a practitioner of the medical arts, I've encountered many dreaded diseases, never one so bizarre as the yellow malaise. Although it is I who am the doctor, it was Sherlock Holmes who correctly diagnosed the cause, prescribed the cure. It all began when our landlady, Mrs. Hudson, entered to announce a visitor young woman to see you, Mr. Holmes, but she refuses to identify herself or state the nature of her business. That's quite all right, Mrs. Hudson. Show her in. Oh. Mr. Holmes. Will you 
You don't know me, Mr. Holmes, but I desperately need your help. You are Miss Matilda Morris, the public relations director hired by hotel owner Mr. Hampton Upton. You are here to solicit my assistance in the investigation of the peculiar demise last year of the hotel's head housekeeper, Emma Trueblood. That's right. Heavens, Holmes, how do you know all that? Well, from the distinctive sound of the horses, I knew that the hotel carriage had stopped outside 221B Baker Street. Please, won't you sit down, Miss Morris? Thank you. The fact that our visitor is wearing the hotel crest on her jacket suggests that she is an employee of the hotel. Yes, of course, but... Uh... How do you know her name and job title? Elementary, my dear Watson. Miss Morris's initials are monogrammed on the handkerchief she's holding in her left hand. They are the same initials as the public relations director whose appointment was announced in the London Times last year, if I am not mistaken. You are correct, Mr. Holmes. But what has this to do with the late Miss uh, Trueblood? As I have never met Miss Morris before, her visit must be of a professional nature rather than a social call. The only criminal matter I am aware of connected with the hotel was the odd death a year ago of Miss Trueblood. As I recall, Scotland Yard concluded that no foul play was involved, although the deceased had unexplained yellow stains on her tongue. <gasps> yes, Holmes. The mysterious yellow malaise matter. Dreaded disease caused by some obscure microbe, no doubt. On the contrary, Watson. I am now certain that the poor woman was murdered. Murdered? <gasps> My word, Holmes, what makes you think that? Someone is attempting to kill you, just as they did Miss Trueblood. If my thinking is correct, Miss Morris, you carry a secret which was also carried by her. Secret, Holmes. Oh. Mrs. Hudson! Are you stable, Miss Morris? I'm... I'm afraid I'm a bit dizzy. Hurry, Watson. Rush Miss Morris to the hospital. And in order to save her life, we must discover A, the intended killer, B, the weapon, C, how the weapon was administered, D, the motive, and E, the secret carried by both Miss Morris and Miss Trueblood. The game is afoot. Now it's time for quick quiz number one. When was Miss Trueblood murdered? Write your answer in the first space on your quick quiz sheet. You have ten seconds to do this. All right, time's up. The correct answer is last year, or a year ago. Those who got this right may take an extra turn during the first round of card playing, which is coming up right now. That means you get three turns instead of the usual two. Remember, a turn consists of picking up either a location card, a badge card, or a key card. Oh, those two and their adventures. Why couldn't I find a, a nice salesman to rent this place? Oh. After we took Miss Morris to the hospital, Holmes and I travelled to the hotel. According to Holmes, both Miss Trueblood and Miss Morris were poisoned here. We prevailed upon Bellman Rhett Barnett to introduce us to several suspects. First, we met the hotel owner's daughter, Miss Molly Upton. My future boss, sir. Since her mother died three years ago, she's the old man's sole heir. Then, the hotel chef, Miss Jennifer Northlot. This lady makes the best Yorkshire pudding in the Hall of London. Cooks a ton of it for the patrons every week, Mr. Holmes. Night watchman, Manfred Mason. And he, he has delusions of grandeur. He told maid Vivian Sutton that he is the illegitimate son of hotel owner Hampton Upton. <laughs> Anna 
and hotel maid, Vivian Sutton. By the way, Barnet looked at Miss Sutton. I could tell he was rather infatuated. Finally, we met the hotel owner himself, Mr. Since the death of his wife, he's become a real uh, lady killer. Upton pledged his full cooperation to Holmes and told the bellman to allow us access to the entire hotel. Time for quick quiz number two. What was groundskeeper Manfred Mason holding in his hand? Write your answer in quick quiz space number two. You have uh, ten seconds to do that. Jolly good. No more writing. Those of you who wrote rake in space number two Sorry may take... to interrupt out. Wait, but uh, Manfred Mason was quite clearly introduced to us as the night watchman, not the groundskeeper. But he was carrying a rake. Oh, sight and hearing are two quite distinct faculties, old boy. Just because a man carries a rake, it doesn't necessarily mean he's a groundskeeper. Yes, yes. Of course, Holmes. Excellent point. So those of you who wrote that Manfred Mason was not the groundskeeper may take an extra turn. But those of you who wrote rake must learn to pay closer attention if you mean to win this game. Watson. Uh, coming, Holmes. Time for another round of card playing. Stop the tape. Take your turns. Before leaving the hotel, Holmes wanted to inspect the desk belonging to Miss Morris. There we examine the contents of the desk. A small bottle of gin, a packet of curry from India, a box of chocolates, some stationery, some postage stamps, and a letter addressed to Miss Morris. Reminds me, Holmes, of the letter I need to post. I hope Miss Morris won't mind if I borrow a stamp. Interesting. What is it, Holmes? Letter to Miss Morris from her employer. Hampton Upton. Nicely. What do you make of it, Watson? Oh. If you want my guess, I think it's a love letter. Very perceptive, Holmes. I detected a number of endearing phrases, which led me to that conclusion. You mean phrases like, I cherish your kisses more than life itself, <clears throat> your love, puppy, after? Yes. Where are we off to now, Holmes? To the newspaper shop, where I believe we shall find a motive clue. Then to the apothecary, where I hope to uncover the prescription for Miss Trueblood's murder. I sincerely hope you washed your hands before we left the hotel, Watson. Oh, why? Because there's a good chance you handled the murder weapon at the hotel. Oh. <laughs> Gentlemen, may I help you? Oh, oh, please, sir, don't leave my children orphans. <laughs> it's all right, sir. There's no need to panic. I was only reaching for my card. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Holmes. Uh, been a little bit jittery lately. My shop was uh, broken into recently. Was anything of value stolen? Why, oh, yes. The odd thing. The only item that was taken was a rare experimental drug called Yellow Rain, a, a mycotoxin derived from beehives. I stock it for uh, Dr. Dan Weston of the biochemistry department at the university. Good grief, Holmes. What would they think of next? This contraption dispenses postage stamps when you insert a coin. Oh, yes. I installed it to attract customers to the shop. But it seems only the young people like Miss Molly Upton are capable of appreciating modern technology like this. One more thing. Has yellow rain ever been stolen from your apothecary before? Why, yes. About a year ago. For what reason, I cannot imagine. It's, um, 
It's pretty nasty stuff. That's probably the reason. Come, Watson, we have a crime to report. You mean you? I mean, we have solved this adventure already? Yes, we now know the killer, the weapon, how the weapon was administered, and the motive. But what about the secret held by Miss Trueblood and Miss Morris? I believe we shall find the answer to that at the hospital. And as you and I are going there anyway. To check on the condition of Miss Morris? Yes, and to check on your condition as well, old chap. Condition? Have you examined your tongue lately, Watson? My tongue? My God, Holmes, it's yellow. Yes, Watson, it appears you have contracted the yellow malaise. Yellow malaise? Holmes, there's no time to waste. My good man, would you be so kind as to read that? Watson! Do you know the solution? If not, continue taking turns until you've figured it out. A turn now consists of picking a card or replaying a scene from this adventure. Do not play tape forward again until you wish to see the solution. Why did she do it, Holmes? Elementary Watson. As hotel owner Hampton Upton was a widower, his only child, Molly, would be the sole heir to his estate when he died. That is, Molly would inherit it all, provided Hampton didn't remarry and hire more heirs. See, when Molly learned that hotel housekeeper Miss Trueblood was pregnant with Hampton's child, but Hampton planned to marry the lady, Molly acted to protect her inheritance. Nicely. Using knowledge gleaned from her unsuspecting fiancé, biochemist Dan Weston, Molly stole yellow rain from the apothecary. Then to administer it to her victim, she spread it on the back of postage stamps purchased at the apothecary. Correct. She then asked Miss Trueblood to post and stamp some letters. Poison touched her tongue, the yellow rain took its dreadful effect. Apart from the yellow streaks on her tongue, nothing about the victim's illness aroused suspicion. Dastardly deed. The poor woman literally licked herself to death. Unfortunately for Molly, her lively father fell in love again, this time with public relations director Matilda Morris. So that was their common secret. Miss Morris was also carrying Upton's child. But how do you know that, Holmes? Oh, simple observation and deduction, Watson. When Miss Morris first came to see us, her dress was tight around her waist, indicating a recent weight gain. A stylish woman like Miss Morris would have changed her wardrobe to match her girth unless she expected her shape to continue to change. Since she was temporarily making do with undersized garments, I concluded she was pregnant and didn't want to purchase maternity clothes before her marriage was announced. But why didn't the poison work on Miss Morris? Oh, it was working all right. Only Miss Morris hadn't yet ingested a fatal dose. It was only a matter of time. That is, if we had not intervened. Well done, Holmes. And well done to that master detective out there who solved this adventure. Dr. Watson, that letter you wanted me to post, you forgot to put a stamp on it. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Mrs. Hudson, would you mind? Listen to this, Holmes. Holmes! The police are baffled because a Mr. Stanley Crimson, a dock worker who was an excellent swimmer, found drowned at the dock. Ah, doesn't take much to baffle Scotland Yard. 
Yes, but this crimson fellow was seen touching the statue of the bronze gladiator at the museum shortly before his death. Appears he too was a victim of the gladiator's curse. Rubbish, Watson. There are quite enough plausible reasons for a man's death without turning to the supernatural for answers. But you must admit, Holmes, over the years there have been several unexplained deaths linked to the curse. Yes, and I suspect there is a simple explanation for each death. Murder. Murder? But who? Why? How? What is this curse about, Holmes? Bravo, Watson. You've asked all the right questions. Grab your coat and we shall find the answers to A. Who killed Mr. Crimson? B. Why he was killed? C. The weapon used in his death? And D. The mystery behind the curse? Game is afoot. Our first stop was the museum where we examined the infamous bronze gladiator and met with museum curator Alan Langford. Who told us the history of the statue. The statue was sculpted by Samuel Rathbone five years ago on commission by the Alpha Brotherhood. What is the Alpha Brotherhood? A social club formed by four local tradesmen. They celebrated the inception of their club by financing the statue. Upon its completion, they towed it over to the museum on loan for a period of seven years. Seven years? How curious. Do you happen to have the names of the Brotherhood members? As a matter of fact, Mr. Holmes, I've written their names for you on this slip of paper. You can see the names on this list by going to the Old Bailey. You said there were four members. Only three are listed here. Now, the fourth member was Stanley Crimson. From the hospital, we went to the newspaper shop, where Holmes said he found a key motive clue. Our next stop was the pub. Holmes had learned that the Alpha Brotherhood was convening there today. Thinking of joining, Holmes? Hardly, old boy. As a matter of fact, the Brotherhood hasn't added any new members since its formation five years ago. What do you think of that? I think they should find a new membership director. <laughs> At the pub, we met the three surviving members of the Alpha Brotherhood. Thaddeus Kramer. Charles Siblings. And Alfred Nahr. We hear you've been inquiring into the death of our good friend, Stanley Crimson. We warned that nincompoop not to touch a gladiator, but he wouldn't listen. Great poor Stanley never was a very cautious soul. I understand Mr. Crimson met here with you gentlemen the night of his accident. That's correct. We were just talking. And drinking. <laughs> Can you recall what you were talking about? Nothing important. Just things. You know, the kind of things men talk about in pubs. <laughs> Women! <laughs> <laughs> when Mr. Crimson departed, what was his destination? I hope for his sake it was heaven. <laughs> <laughs> he said he was going up. He lived in a little flat on the other side of the dock where he worked. 
Yes, I remember now. He was quite grimy from unloading coffee beans all day and said he wanted a bath. Why did he leave so suddenly? How should we know? Perhaps he was beginning to itch. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Holmes, who told you Stanley left suddenly? Your friend did just now. We return to the museum, where this time we witness some shooting. The first player to spot the shooting should acknowledge it by shouting out. This will earn you a bonus turn at the end of this chapter. I say, Holmes, what are we doing back here? I wish to prove a point about the gladiator's curse, Watson. Holmes, have you gone mad? It's all right, my good man. We were just leaving. We were? Yes, Watson. We're on our way to Scotland Yard to report a crime. I now know the killer, the motive, the weapon, and the mystery behind the gladiator's curse. Excellent, Holmes. You've solved this case in record time. Oh, it's very good of you to say so, old chap. But I think your watch has stopped. Oh, bother. So it has. The photographer behind me, by the way, was the one doing the shooting. If none of you has acknowledged that yet, too late. But if one of you did shout out, then congratulations. Because I think... Pardon me, old boy, but I definitely didn't hear anyone shout the word out. Has it? Well, your instructions were to acknowledge the shooting by shouting out, O-U-T. Oh, yes. Yes, you're quite right, Holmes. So only the first one of you who spotted the shooting and shouted the word out they take a bonus turn at the start of this round of card playing. And if you got this one right, perhaps I should be writing about your adventures. I found it odd, Watson, that the Alpha Brotherhood was formed five years ago, immediately after the Gabler jewel theft. The timing was not a coincidence. The Brotherhood committed the burglary, and when they found the jewels too difficult to fence, they decided to hide them until the time was right. So they commissioned Samuel Rathbone to sculpt the gladiator and include a secret chamber for the jewels? Precisely. When I tapped the statue, it was quite evident that the helmet was hollow. They then placed the gladiator at the museum. The perfect hiding place. Plain sight for all to see. Why did they kill Stanley Crimson? Uh, when Crimson learned he had a fatal illness, he demanded his share immediately. The others decided they had to get rid of him in order to protect their interest. So they got Crimson drunk and pushed him off the dock? Wrong. After he left the pub, they went to his flat and broke in. They found him taking a bath, drowned him in his own tub, disposed of his body at the dock. Explains the soapy water found in his lungs. Holmes, you did it again. No, we did it again, old chap. Oh, by the way, Watson, a little present for you. You pocket watch. Oh, why, Holmes, what have I done to deserve this? You've allowed this episode to run past its allotted time. We mustn't allow that to happen again, old chap. Holmes. <laughs>
I've always wondered whether my proximity to the great Sherlock Holmes might not cause me to exaggerate his prowess. Surely there must be great detectives elsewhere just waiting to be discovered. Little did I know that this very question was about to be put to the test when Inspector Lestrade called one morning at 221B Baker Street. Greetings, Lestrade. I see you have a problem. How did you know? You come to Baker Street only when you have a problem. But this time... It's, it's... a personal problem. How do you live with him? You smoke cigars only when you have a personal problem. And since your work attire is much keener than usual, I'd say the problem is job-related. You're trying to impress someone at Scotland Yard. Is he ever wrong? Actually, he did make a significant error on one occasion. It was a case where he thought he was wrong. Turned out he was really right. I recall reading in the newspaper about a young detective called Pickering who's been making quite a name for himself at the Yard. Wretched fellow is only 27 years old. It's my guess you fear this Pickering fellow is after your job as Chief Inspector. I tell you, Holmes, Pickering's a one-man Scotland Yard. In the past month, he has captured the Soho Slasher, Meat Axe Annie, and Jack the Firebug. And he apprehended each one of them with hardly so much as a piece of cobblestone as a clue. I say, he sounds like the greatest sleuth of all times. Oh. Uh, except for Sherlock Holmes, of course. Just minutes ago, Holmes, the Duke of Kesterton was found murdered at the dock. I told my men not to touch the body until I'd had a chance to examine the evidence. I thought you may wish to come with me and then perhaps we could... Uh, solve this case before Pickering can solve it. Holmes, have I ever told you how much I love your hat? There's no need to grovel, Lestrade. I'll be happy to assist you. Come, Watson. In order to save the inspector's job, we must discover A, who killed the Duke, B, with what, C, why, and D, the Duke's secret. Game is afoot. The Duke of Kesterton had recently returned from an archaeological expedition in Egypt. Accompanying the Duke on his trip was his assistant, Maggie Lowley. Wife of pub owner, Jonathan Lowley. The findings of this expedition were to be turned over to Oliver Loring curator of the London Museum. Well, Holmes, there's the body. Now, who did it? Who? Who? Good heavens, man, you sound like an owl. Give Holmes a chance. and had time to look for clues yet. Blasted Pickering. Pickering. So nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Lestrudel. That's Lestrade. And these two gentlemen must be? Yes, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. <laughs> yes, of course. I understand that Holmes was considered quite a competent sleuth in his day. In his day? How long have you been here, Inspector? Just a matter of minutes. Well, Holmes and I were just discussing a couple of theories concerning the Duke's murder. Save your energy, old chap. You see, I've already solved the case. Well, uh, so have we. Holmes, sir, uh, tell the inspector who murdered the Duke. I'm afraid I haven't got the foggiest idea. Holmes!
We can see from the marks on the Duke's neck that the poor fellow was strangled. Since the Duke is a large man, the killer must also be a large man. Then, there is this. What's that? The untrained eye. An ordinary piece of thread. But to a master detective. The key to the puzzle. You mean you can tell who murdered the Duke by a piece of thread? It's quite simple. First, the thread was found under the Duke's fingernail, indicating a struggle. Second, there's wood dust on the thread. The kind found on floors in pubs, indicating the killer must spend a lot of time in the pub. Third, the thread is from an inexpensive material, suggesting the killer is a commoner. And fourth, thread smells of cologne. Same kind of cologne that pub owner Jonathan Lowley is wearing. You must be daft. Why would I kill the Duke? He was my friend. Because you found out the Duke was having an affair with your wife. This cigarette case is proof of that. The engraving reads, To my dearest Richard, love Maggie. So there you have it. The killer is Jonathan Lowley. The weapon is his hands. The motive, jealousy. Oh. Good heavens, Pickering. You're amazing. Elementary, my dear Watson. Wouldn't you say so, Holmes? Good show, Holmes. Now, if you hear of a job for a former Scotland Yard inspector, perhaps you'll let me know. Well, suppose this adventure is over. For those of you who have managed to... Uh... Don't be so hasty, Watson. It isn't over until the fat lady sings. Fat lady, Holmes? I don't hear any fat lady singing. Precisely. Come, Watson. I believe an important clue awaits us at the newspaper shop. But, Holmes... After stopping at the newspaper shop, we travelled to the pub, where we spoke with Maggie Lowley, wife of accused murderer Jonathan Lowley. Mrs. Lowley, is it true that you and the Duke were romantically involved? Oh, Holmes, even if that were true, Jonathan would never have killed the Duke. How can you be so sure? Oh, Holmes, all I can tell you is that I'm certain he's innocent. Give me a light. Thank you, ma'am. Mrs. Lowley, is there anyone who may have wanted to see the Duke dead? Anyone he quarrelled with lately? Oh, he did get into a minor altercation with Oliver Loring the other day. The museum curator? That's right. It was over the value of some of the artefacts that Richard... I mean, the, the Duke brought back with him from Egypt. Was Oliver Loring the gentleman at the dock with his arm in a sling? That's right. Thank you, Mrs. Lowley. You've been quite helpful. By the way, that's a lovely brooch you're wearing. Are those diamonds real? They are. Like the diamond in my ring. It was a gift from my husband. I thought so. Come, Watson. But, Holmes, I haven't finished my... to now, Holmes, to give our evidence to Lestrade. What evidence? We now know that Pickering's solution is false. You know that? Surely you noticed the two big clues at the pub, Watson. What two big clues? On Maggie Lowley's chest. Really, Holmes? The key to this case was the Duke's secret. A common but not so common union. Good Holmes, what on earth's that noise? That, Watson, is the fat lady singing. Oh, does that mean... Yes, Watson. This adventure is over. Good 
why did he do it, Holmes? An entry, Watson. Pickering was an ambitious man. Thought he could advance his career to the top of Scotland Yard by creating crimes and then solving them. But how could a small man like Pickering overpower a man the size of the Duke? Pickering lured the Duke to the dock, then grabbed the nearest item he could find, a jar of lye, and used it to knock the Duke unconscious. Then Pickering proceeded to strangle the Duke to make it look as if he was overpowered by a much larger man like Lowley. But I knew Jonathan Lowley couldn't have committed the crime because of the mark on the left side of the Duke's neck. It was caused by someone who wore a ring. And since no one can be strangled from behind, I concluded that the killer wore a ring on his right hand. Jonathan wasn't wearing a ring, but Pickering was. Maggie's ring was on her left hand, and as for Oliver Loring, he had a broken arm. He wouldn't have been able to strangle anyone. What about the cigarette case? Ah, this was a key clue. Pickering planted it on the body. You see, Pickering got his information about the Duke and Maggie's supposed affair from the newspaper. In the article, Maggie's name was spelled M-A-G-G-I-E. Pickering spelled it that way on the cigarette case. But the paper was wrong. According to the name tag Maggie wore at the pub, the correct spelling of her name was M-A-G-G-Y. Maggie would certainly have seen to it that her name was spelled correctly on any gift she might give to her husband. Her husband? That was the Duke's secret. The Duke and Maggie were actually husband and wife. He had to keep his marriage to a commoner like Maggie a secret or risk losing his title. Jonathan Lowley was merely a friend posing as Maggie's husband. On earth did you deduce that? Well, I suspected something was wrong when I saw Maggie's diamond brooch and ring. A pub owner could never have afforded to buy his wife such jewellery. <laughs> You're incredible, Holmes. Thanks to you, Pickering's behind bars, my job as Chief Inspector is safe. That is, unless Sherlock Holmes should apply for a job at the Yard. You wouldn't, would you, Holmes? It's no secret to anyone who knows him that the thing Sherlock Holmes loves most in life is a good mystery, or, as he is wont to phrase it, a little problem to solve. It doesn't matter what time of day such a problem presents itself. In fact, I truly believe that the odder the hour, the more it appeals to Holmes' boyish sense of adventure. One such occasion, when Holmes woke me in the middle of the night and insisted upon dragging me with him, involved a truly shocking affair which I have recorded as the adventure of the Muldanian terrorist. Hey, Holmes, do you know what time it is? As a matter of fact, I do, Watson. It's 3.34. 3.34 in the morning. Couldn't this at least wait until dawn? I'm afraid not, old chap. We must go at once. The game is afoot. Would you mind telling me what this is about, Holmes? I received this note from Inspector Lestrade. Would you mind telling me what it says, Holmes? It says, come to the hotel at once. The Moldanian terrorist has struck again. I recalled seeing a small item in the newspaper a few weeks ago about a bloody attack at the pub by a lone gun-wielding terrorist from the country of Moldania. I'd learned later that Moldania was a small country bordered by the Indian Ocean. It had been colonized by Great Britain. Recently, there had been reports of a small resistance group which had formed in Moldania for the purpose of seeking independence from the United Kingdom. And this group had engaged in various terrorist acts aimed at buildings occupied by British officials. Watson. Mm, what? Aren't you forgetting something, old chap? Oh, <clears throat> what are we trying to solve anyway, Holmes? 
We must discover A, the identity of the terrorist, B, the motive for his attacks, and C, where he plans to strike next. At the hotel, we met Lestrade, and he informed us of the circumstances. Four people were killed in the lobby, including the night manager, a night maid, and two guests. The killer left a calling card with the green and gold insignia of the Muldanian flag on one side, and the words Raj Mavek Muldania printed on the other. It's identical to the card left in the pub a few weeks ago. The words Razmavek Muldania translate long live Muldania. May I keep this for a while, Estrade? Well, it is evidence, Holmes. Thank you, Inspector. But, uh... We learned that seven persons had been present during the pub attack, which occurred at closing time. Six were killed, one survived. The survivor, a Mr. Daniel Merritt, had described the killer as a lone gunman wearing a green and gold knit mask over his entire head and wielding two revolvers. At the hotel, Holmes spoke with night watchman Manfred Mason. Who heard the shooting but didn't see a thing. <laughs> with bank employee Kent Springforth, husband of the murdered night maid. Mr. Springforth had arrived at 3 a.m. to share tea with his wife on her break, only to find she had been slain just minutes before. He spent a good deal of time searching the lobby for clues. And when we finally left, we were exhausted. I suggested to Holmes that we return to Baker Street and catch a few winks. But as long as there was a major crime to solve, my friend was not about to rest. You find it peculiar, Watson, that a terrorist would plan his attack so late at night. Peculiar, Holmes? Yes, both attacks took place at times when there were relatively few people present. One would think a terrorist could make a greater impact for his cause by selecting a time during the day, when both the hotel and pub would be more densely populated. But he could only carry two guns at once, Holmes. And he may have feared with too many people present he would be apprehended. Oh, yes. In which case he could have planted an explosive device, such as the ones used in the Moldanian terrorist attacks, as reported in the newspaper. Perhaps his terrorist just doesn't know how to make a good bomb. Perhaps. Since we're all awake, let's have a quick quiz to see who's paying closest attention. According to the sign on the hotel's front desk, what time is checkout time? Write your answer in space number three. You have ten seconds. Hey, 
what? What? Quick quiz answer. Oh, right. <clears throat> According to the sign in the hotel, checkout time is noon. Actually, Watson, According to the hotel sign, checkout time was noom. Noom? Noom. The sign was quite clearly spelled N O O M. The letter M is quite distinct from the letter N. Yes, of course, Holmes. But even though the sign may have been misspelled, we all know what time it meant. Oh, but that's another question entirely, Watson. Your question was not what time did the sign mean. Good point. Those of you who wrote noom. May take an extra turn in the upcoming round of card playing. Well, go on. Take your turns. If it were daylight, Watson, I have no doubt we should find significant clues at the library and the university. But since it's not... Since it's not, we'll head for the dock. At the dock, we found Sea Captain, former Merchant Marine, Seth McThird, doing his early morning exercises. Maldanian, eh? The only Maldanian chap I can think of is a fellow named Rasix or Rasix, something like that. Arrived on a steamer from India about two weeks ago. Does our jobs at the hospital, I believe. Holmes showed the captain the green and gold card from the hotel. Eh? Huh. Well, that's the Maldanian flag, all right. Those words translate, Long live Maldania. Yes, but no Maldanian would ever say a thing like that. Why is that, Captain? Well, a Maldanian nationalist would say, uh, Bessar al Masa, which means, my homeland forever. You mean the expression long live is strictly British? That's quiet. Come, Watson, I believe we have solved this case. That means we can get some sleep. Yes, right after we stop at Scotland Yard. Come, Watson. So, when he learned of his wife's infidelity, Springforth sought revenge by murder. But he hoped to throw suspicion from himself and attempted to disguise his crimes as the actions of a mad foreign terrorist, <laughs> hoping that Scotland Yard would see the forest and not the trees. Springforth learned that his wife's lover, J.T. Perry, frequented the pub late at night, so he planned his first attack there. The second attack, of course, was at the hotel, where he murdered his wife among others. The third attack would have been at the university, where his wife's other lover, Professor Austin April, or would certainly have been one of the victims. After that, Springforth planned for the mythical Moldanian assassin to slip quietly into oblivion. Just as you have done now, old man. Good night, Watson. I say, Holmes, you'll never guess what's in today's paper. It says the International Society of Inventors is holding a convention right here in London. 
Inventors from all over the world will be attending. Good God. How did you deduce that? I read the paper. Oh. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank goodness I found you. I'm sorry to burst in on you like this. It's a matter of life and death. My name is Thomas Edison. Yes, but how did you... The pen in your top left-hand pocket is from the Science Institute, indicating you're an inventor here for the forthcoming convention. Your attire is of the highest order, indicating you're quite successful. This, combined with your American accent and your cufflinks, which bear the initials T.E., lead me to one conclusion only, that you are Thomas Edison, one of the world's greatest inventors. The world's greatest inventor. I'm Dr. Watson. And this is the world's greatest detective, Sherlock Holmes. I need your help. Someone is trying to kill me. I found this note under my door. Dear Mr. Edison, you insidious insect. You shall be exterminated before the week is out. Holmes told Edison to return to the hotel. We would investigate the matter. Come, Watson. To save Thomas Edison's life, we must determine A, who is trying to kill him, B, the killer's motive, and C, the intended weapon. The game is afoot. Holmes and I were on our way out when another inventor, Alexander Graham Bell, entered our parlour. He told us that someone had broken into his room and stolen his papers for a new invention. He wanted Holmes to find the thief and the papers. The Bell, it's not often that I encounter a client as distinguished as yourself. Oh, could I have your autograph? Well, I don't see why not. Could you make it out to Sherlock Holmes, you insidious insect? Well, not you, Mr. Bell. It's what all my friends call me. What do you say? You insidious insect. Ah, oh, I'm pence put ink all over my fingers. The facilities are down the hall. Look, Holmes. Bell's handwriting is the same as the handwriting on the letter to Edison. Does this mean the case is solved? I'm afraid not, Watson. It means there are even more things to solve than I first thought. To recover Bell's papers, we must determine D, who stole the papers, E, the location of the papers, F, why the papers were stolen, and G, the mastermind behind this whole plot. Go ahead and add D, E, F, and G to your solution list. Tell me about some of the other inventors staying at the hotel. After leaving my room this morning, I met two brothers in the hotel lobby, Wilbur and Orville Wright. I can never remember which is which. Anyway, they were arguing over their latest plans for a flying machine. A what? A machine. That flies like a bird. <laughs> Sounds like these brothers have been nipping at the old gin. What say, Holmes, eh? <laughs> Moments later, Thomas Edison arrived. A 
and started nosing around as usual, looking for anything he could get his hands on and patent. That man would steal his own mother's needlepoint if he thought it could be mass-produced for a profit. Then there's Mr. Ramon Valdez, the blind inventor who's working on orthopedic horseshoes. <laughs> here, let me help you, Mr. Valdez. Aye, lots of flammables in here, what with all the inventions. Better put that cigar out, eh? Act. Ramon's the one who suggested I come and see you. Is that so? Holmes asked about other inventors at the convention. Bell recalled one. Did indeed sound unusual. Hmm. If not, suspect. His name was Sebastian Kane. He has this <laughs> bicycle contraption. I'm not sure what the damn thing is supposed to do, but it definitely looks impressive. Sebastian is a very prolific inventor, but it seems he's always a step behind. He had such high hopes for his lemon-orange drink called Six-Up and his cola called Nurse Pepper. He is hoping his latest invention will bring him his long-awaited recognition. <laughs> he calls it the Hula Square. Thank you, Mr. Bell. You've been most helpful. Dr. Watson and I will attend to the case immediately. I appreciate it. And look out for that, Edison. He's a shifty one. Time for quick quiz number four. Let's see if you've been paying attention. How many canes were seen at the hotel? You have ten seconds to write your answer. Very well. Stop writing. The correct answer is two. Ramon Valdez and Orville Wright each carried a cane. Excuse me, Watson, but there were actually three canes at the hotel. You forgot the inventor, Sebastian Kane. Oh, oh of course. Uh, that's what I meant to say. Three canes. Come, Watson. We must go to the hotel to prevent Thomas Edison's murder. Sebastian Kane. I knew that. But if Bell did not send the death threat to Edison, why does his handwriting match the handwriting on the letter? A superb job of forgery. If Bell had been guilty, he would never have incriminated himself by giving me a sample of his handwriting. Whoever sent that letter wanted to frame Bell, and that someone was Ramon Valdez. You mean the blind Spaniard? Ah. The Spaniard is not blind. Ramon Valdez is none other than the infamous Colonel Sebastian Moran in disguise. Of course. Moran is a notorious master of forgery and disguise. How did he plan to kill Edison? Moran knew that Thomas Edison was fatally allergic to soybeans. He planned to slip a toxic dose into Edison's drink during the convention banquet. Earlier, Moran had even asked Bell to pick up some of the soybean extract from the apothecary, thereby further incriminating Bell following the murder. Abolical. But why did he want to murder Edison and frame Bell? To assist his evil mentor, Professor Moriarty, in his plot to take over world communications. Moriarty knew that with Bell and Edison out of the way, he could steal the idea for the telephone. The what? The telephone. It's an idea that Edison and Bell have both been working on, which could change the course of history. So that's why Moriarty had Moran break into Bell's room to steal his plans for the, um... The telephone, precisely. 
But Moran's room was searched. Where did he conceal the papers? Where no one would suspect. Inside his white cane. I noticed that the design on the cane handle didn't align properly with the design on the cane itself, suggesting that the handle was possible. Good show, Holmes. And good show to all of you out there who got the correct solution. Watson, what have you got in that parcel? Just a little something I purchased at the inventor's convention. I think it holds a great deal of promise. A hula square? Aren't you a little old for that sort of thing, old boy? At all. Matter of fact, getting rather good at it. Morning. I come away. The other way, well, well, I will. Well, First check. Museum, June 27th. The second attack. Hub, August 8th. Another round of ale, thanks, Squire. Excuse me a minute, love. Got to make a wee stop at the WC. Bit of a cute. The third attack. Apothecary. September 19th. I've got just the thing for eye fevers. Two of these should cure your ill. Oh dear, perhaps you should take the whole bottle. There's been a rash of brutal murders, latest involving the stabbing of a young woman at the apothecary, and the guard has uncovered a bizarre link. Prior to a number of the victims complained of being jabbed in the buttocks, umbrella. How curious. It appears that someone is going through the city with an umbrella marking people for death. Why so pale, Watson? Just about a week ago that I was jabbed with an umbrella myself. Elderly chap with a beard, I believe. How uncommon. Come on, Holmes. London is full of elderly men with beards. Well, not the beard, Watson, the umbrella. Last week we had a dry spell. Come, Watson. In order to save your life, we must determine A, the killer or killers, B, the purpose of the umbrella attacks, C, the motive for the murders, and D, what all the victims had in common. The game is afoot. First, we visited the apothecary where we met pharmacist Maxwell Ladd. Holmes showed Ladd a list of the murder victims. The pharmacist confirmed Holmes' suspicion that he had dispensed medicine to each of the victims shortly before they died. What was the nature of their illness? 
all taking medicine for high fever. You make it. No coincidence. Didn't Inspector Lestrade say they were all killed violently? By gunshot, stabbing, or strangulation? Yes, but the fact that 12 persons were treated for fevers before they were murdered is an extraordinary coincidence. If you think the fevers were induced by the umbrella attacks, why haven't I experienced a fever? Because you were jabbed only a week ago. While I'm here, I'd better write myself a prescription. After stopping at the university, we headed for the hospital. There we met with Dr. Matthew Birchboy, who had performed the post-mortem examinations of the murder victim. We also met a male nurse by the name of Wilbur Madison. Holmes. Dr. Watson. My assistant, Madison. Dr. Birchboy, you look familiar. Have we met? I don't think so. Perhaps you served in Afghanistan together. What makes you say that? Both wear the same regimental ring. Of course, that's where I would have seen you. Well, it's always nice to meet a fellow fusilier. Dr. Birchboy, what light can you shed on these men? Unfortunately, I'm afraid I have nothing to offer, other than my hope that you catch the killer, or killers. I have an idea, Watson. I must make a discreet inquiry. I will meet you in the lobby of the hotel at 4 p.m. Please go there now and wait for me. Holmes, it's only 2.30. Please follow my instructions, old boy. I'll have Lestrade assign Constable Brown to look after you until I arrive. Constable Brown? Oh, he's one of London's finest bobbies, Watson. He'll find you at the hotel and introduce you. Thank you, Doctor. I hope we... Excuse me, sir. Uh, could oh, you no, tell you me the... Don't... Dr. Watson! What are you doing to this poor gentleman? He's anything but a gentleman. That beard is obviously just a disguise. Oh, poor disguise. Guys. Mr. Arnold Oakley, our most cherished customer. Oh, my mistake, old man. I thought you were a psychotic murderer. There he is! Mr. Oakley, come on, let's go and have a sit down. You'll feel much better. Dr. Watson, I'm uh, Constable Brown. Constable Brown, it's definitely a pleasure to meet you. I must confess, Holmes, while I am delighted with the outcome, I have some reservations about your methods. Did you really need me to serve as a decoy to capture Dr. Birchboy? Would have been in far greater danger had we not smoked him out when we did. Remember, he was very disturbed that you seemed to know him. I've since learned that he had quite a history of medical malpractice and unethical research. In time, you may have remembered enough about him to raise suspicions. I don't understand Dr. Birchboy's motive for the umbrella attacks. He was working to develop a vaccine against rabies. 
First, he would inject unsuspecting members of the public with the vaccine. Then, sometime later, to allow antibodies to form, he would inject the same persons with the rabies virus to test the effectiveness of the vaccine. Fortunately for his victims, the vaccine was not very effective. Oh, precisely. But why did he subsequently kill his patients? Oh, once the victims had contracted the disease, their doom was sealed. So he killed them violently in order to avoid any suspicion which might arise from an unexplained outbreak of rabies. Honourable? I must say, Holmes, I've never been more delighted to enter one of your successes into my journal. Congratulations. That's not funny, Holmes. Ab of mirth, old boy. I had just completed five hours of surgery, a favor to a friend. I was dog tired. I arrived home and walked directly into the adventure of the purloined pearl. Stone Holmes? Long day, Watson. Moved that gallstone from Lady Flagstaff today. Enormous woman. Enormous gallstone. Come back here, you what little man. Come back here, how dare Mr. you? Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, now you can't just barge in here. Uncle! Oh. Get after me, Mr. Holmes. Ah, there you are, you little devil. Inspector Lestrade. Yeah, you turn out your boy. Let go of me, you big uh, bully. Oh, no, don't let go of me, you little ruffian. No, oh, no, Inspector. I assure you, Teddy here did not steal the Pearl of Punjab. I know I'm going to regret this more than my first marriage, but how do you know I am in pursuit of the Pearl of Punjab? Elementary, my dear Inspector. I knew you were going to say that. Everyone knows that the pearl was to arrive today at the museum for a brief exhibit. It says in the paper that you have been put in charge of security. I assume you wouldn't desert such an important post merely to chase a common street thief. Common indeed. I'm a professional. So, Holmes, you admit he's a thief. Street thief. And therefore not a likely suspect in such a serious crime. Just the same. I think I'll handcuff the young ragamuffin before he makes a run for it. Looking for these, Inspector? Give me those. This is going to be a most interesting adventure. Be sure to keep your eyes on the screen at all times. To solve this case, gentlemen, we'll need to find A, the true thief, B, the thief's true profession, C, what was really stolen, and D, the location of the pearl. My wallet. The game is afoot. You've caught him. I howled Dover. London Times. Well, uh, the newspaper reporter. Right, sir. Yes, I was just covering the arrival of the Pearl of Punjab when everything went berserk. Well, Mr. Dover, the Times can report that Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard has recovered the Pearl. So you have, Lestrade. Uh, that's L-E-S-T-R-A-D-E. -E. But you still haven't caught the thief. D here, now, Holmes. Watson, may I borrow your glass? Certainly, old man.
Hmm. This certainly is the genuine pearl of Punjab, all right? I'll take that. I'll take that. Say, just who do you I think you... I'll take it out of Miss Dubrow. Oh, Miss Dubrow. Give me honest. that pearl. This little beauty is not leaving my possession. It's evident. This looks like a good time for a round of card play. When we come back, we'll find out who all these people are. Why they're here. What's the matter, you inspector? I'm a Peter Apopo, the shipping and magnet. I own the Pearl of Punjab. And I'm Hattie Dubrow, his secretary. It was I who stopped that thief before I ran off with the I didn't know I had it, honest. I was just sharing marbles on the sidewalk when he fell down. I slip in a drop of the pearl. He starts yelling, and he starts chasing me. You hastily gathered up your marbles and ran, not realizing you'd gathered up the pearl as well. Well, the Pearl of Punjab is now quite safe right here in my pocket. It's... it's gone! It was you, you little rascal! Come here! Where have you... Where you, you tell me where you... You've been picking my pockets again! I have no utility. How can you lose my pearl of punjab? Yeah. You're the most incompetent detective I ever see. My good man, if it's the competent detective you want, you have the best in the world right here. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Surely you know where the pearl is. Sure he does. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Indeed, Teddy. I know exactly where the pearl is. The pen is mightier than the sword, Mr. Holmes. But the gun oh, is mightier than either of them. That's my revolver. So you have the pearl? Not yet, but I will. In a second. Okay, Mr. Holmes, where is the pearl? Better do as he says, Holmes. Who has the pearl? Anyone tries to follow me, I'll shoot. You won't get away with this, Dover. Dear Mr. Lestrade, I already have. <laughs> So that man wasn't a reporter, he was a pickpocket. Precisely. Pretending to be a reporter, he was in the process of pickpocketing the pearl from Peter L. Popo's pocket. You didn't think I could say that, did you? Mr. L. Popo slipped on Teddy's marbles. But what was it you gave the bloke in place with the pearl? Lady Flagstaff's gallstone. You didn't. <laughs> knowing there was a pickpocket among us and knowing how you like to keep a souvenir from your operations, Watson, I made an excuse to go to your bag. I palmed the gallstone when I took the glass out of your bag. Then the thief ran off with the gallstone? Fitting, I'd say. At least more fitting than its previous location, eh, what, eh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're a real smart guy, Mr. Holmes. Where's the real Pearl of Punjab? From the moment Inspector Lestrade took the pearl from you, Mr. Alpopo, it has not left his possession. I thought he looked a bit shifty, Governor. What? Holmes, are you accusing me You've of... You've been having a bit of difficulty lighting your pipe, Inspector, ever since you pocketed the pearl. And that's because the pipe and the pearl were briefly in the same pocket. And when they were, the pesky pearl of Punjab lodged itself in the bowl of your pipe.
although I'm not really sure how serious he was, Sherlock Holmes once remarked in my presence that love was a concept invented by poets and detectives to keep them in work. Indeed, it does seem that an inordinate amount of the crimes we were called upon to solve had their roots in affairs of the heart. One such case presented to us on a bright spring morning when the flowers were in bloom and the birds were in tune, the thoroughly baffling adventure of the maiden's last voyage. Lord Eugene Wesditch, wide-eyed youth of 25, came to us in despair. His fiancée, a Miss Madeline Wells, had disappeared aboard a Portuguese vessel, the Adolfo Oro. According to Lord Westditch, Miss Wells had boarded the ship in Portugal. It was nowhere to be found when the vessel docked in England. You say you were engaged to be married? Well, sir, we weren't officially. I had asked Madeline to marry me, and she said she needed more time to think about making such a serious decision. In fact, that's why she took the cruise to Portugal. It's a country she's always wanted to see. And as a gesture of my feelings for her, I even paid for her passage. You're a very generous man, Lord Westditch. A man of means, Mr. Holmes. I should gladly pay whatever you require. But I must find out what happened to the woman I love. Holmes agreed to look into the matter, although I had a distinct sense he did so without his usual enthusiasm for such mysteries. Possibly because of some concern for what he might find. I didn't want to say so in front of the boy, Watson, but I sense a crime is involved here. I have no doubt that a search will lead us to the discovery of A, the crime that has been committed, B, the criminal, C, the motive, D, how the crime was committed, and E, the whereabouts of Miss Madeline Wells. Say, old chap, aren't you forgetting something? Hey, Watson? Well, I suppose I can do it this one time. The game is afloat. No. Sorry, can I do it again? At the dock, we met William Graves, the chief purser of the Adolfo Oro. Uh, 62 on, 61 off. I counted every last one of them myself, gentlemen. Saw Miss Wells board in Portugal. When we arrived in port, she didn't come ashore. Her belongings were still in her cabin. That's every inch of that ship, but no Miss Wells. I have a theory about what happened to her. I have two theories. Either fell, was pushed, or jumped. I believe that's three theories, Mr. James. Fell, pushed. Uh, <laughs> there it is. One, two, three. You know, Holmes, I believe this is the most baffling case we've ever encountered. We've no motive, no weapon, no witnesses, and no body. And if Miss Wells is at the bottom of the ocean, we've no way of knowing. This is one case that must remain unsolved. There so easily, old chap. But we have absolutely no clues, Holmes. Where there is a problem to solve, there are always clues. A matter of finding them. Holmes directed our carriage to the hospital, where we met and spoke with a co-worker of mine, a young nurse by the name of Miss Matilda Tunnell. Well, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Holmes. 
And I tell you this because I really cared for Maddie, and I'm concerned for her. He didn't love Eugène Wesdit. He adored her, and she didn't want to break his heart. Who was the other gentleman in her life? How did you know about him? Yes, Holmes, how do you know about him? His name was Philippe de la Holes. She met him when he was a patient at the hospital. He's an older gentleman, very handsome, very distinct. Maddie really fell for him. You happen to know what he does for a living? Foreign businessman of some sort. Foreign? From what country? Portugal. We went back to the dock, where Holmes checked the passenger manifest for the Adolfo Oro. Philippe de la Holes was confirmed as a passenger on the very voyage from which Miss Wells disappeared. Although Holmes wouldn't say, it was obvious to me that Mr. de la Holes had now become the prime suspect of our investigation. We then headed to the hotel, where I anticipated we might confront this mysterious Portuguese visitor. Ah, Ritz. Tell me, are you in any way acquainted with a Mr. Philippe de la Holes? Yes, Mr. Holmes. You should ask. Just this moment, I was wondering about Mr. de la Holes. He always stays here with us when he's in town, but this time, for some reason, he cancelled his reservation. He's not in any hot water, is he, Governor? Not yet. We're investigating the disappearance of Miss Madeline Wells. The nurse? Do you remember her? Oh, hard to forget a little darling like that. What a lovely... Uh, <clears throat> I'm usually very discreet about such things, Mr. Holmes, but she used to visit Mr. Delahole's here whenever he was in town. Cool, what a rascal he is. A rascal? Why do you say that? Oh, he's married, don't you know? No, I didn't know. Uh, got a family of four in Portugal. Come, Watson, we have a crime to report. Uh, Mr. Holmes, look, well, what I mean is, uh, I've always thought that whatever two people do when they are alone is their own business. Wouldn't you agree? Not when it's murder. How can we inform Lord Wesditch of the results of our investigation? That the woman he so deeply loved was in love with another man is bad enough. The other man was married to someone else is far worse. But that she killed her married lover, disguised herself and fled is unbearable. Perhaps the young Lord would be better off if love were as deaf as it is blind. What do you think he'll do, Holmes? Do what we all do, Watson. Survive. You know, Holmes, I couldn't help noticing you weren't your usual alert self today. Something troubling you, old friend? Or very observant, Watson. Either I've trained you well, or I'm not as adept at disguising my emotions as I would like to be. Emotions? Today is the anniversary of the day I met her. Irene Adler. The woman. Five years. You know, Watson, I was reading earlier from... One of my favourite poems by Sir Walter Raleigh. The nymph's reply to the shepherd. Mind if I read you a passage? Delighted, old chap. Flowers do fade. Wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, a heart of gall, is fancy's spring, but sorrow's fall.
the years, our good friend Inspector Lestrade has aided Holmes and me on numerous occasions. But our experience working with him has never been so, let's say, interesting as in the adventure of the artful artist. For your book, Lestrade. Inspector had dropped by on a purely social visit and was showing us the book he'd recently had published, entitled Modern Methods in Criminal Investigation. It so happened that we just had a visit from a young woman named Catherine Knight, who had come to Baker Street to solicit our assistance in the matter of her brother's suicide. Her brother, struggling artist Andy Knight, had left a suicide note in a small room above the tobacconist. Articles of his clothing were fished out from the waters below London Bridge, but Andy Knight's body was never found. And his sister suspects foul play. She thinks it's possible, and so do I. I have told her that I would attempt to uncover A, the killer, B, the motive, C, the location of the body, and D, the mastermind behind her brother's disappearance. I'm afraid this time I may be one step ahead of you. You mean you know the solution? Meet me at the pub in one hour. Not only will I present you with the solution, but with the killer too. The game. The foot. After first stopping at the museum and the post office, we arrived at the pub where we found the inspector in good spirits. The patrons included jeweler Nathan Oberman, and town <coughs> tart Patricia Prince. Ah, oh, Holmes, Watson, over here. Greetings, Lestrade. So, tell us, what is the solution to this case? Oh, what's the hurry, Holmes? How about a drink? Shouldn't we be looking for clues? A round of ale for me and my friends, Mr. Notch. Hi, chaps. Long. Oh. I just uh, put them over there, Norm. That's very kind of you, Lestrade. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Since we're not doing much in the way of investigating, let's stop for a quick quiz. Moments ago, the inspector was kind enough to buy us a round of drinks. How many beers did he buy? Write your answer in space number two. You have uh, ten seconds. Time's up. The correct answer is four. Those of you who got four... Sorry, old chap. Uh... But I'm afraid the correct answer is none. Lestrade didn't order four beers. He ordered four ales. Oh, yes. If you wrote down none, take an extra turn during the next round of card playing. Cheers.
I tell you, the future to crime fighting lies right here in this book. There's this new technique I've been developing called finger smudges. You see, people's fingers may all look alike, but their finger smudges are quite different. According to my studies, two out of eight people have the same finger smudge. Uh, for instance, look at this mug. Excuse me, my good man. This is a finger smudge. You find another one that looks like it, and it will have come from the same finger two out of eight times. Now, there's another new technique that I've uh, illustrated in my book called bullet scratches. You see, when a gun is fired, the bullet is marked with several distinctive scratches, which can only be matched to another bullet fired by the same gun. Let me demonstrate. I'll fire a bullet into that dartboard to show you. I'll give up! I give up! That's my purse, you thief! Well done, Inspector. You apprehended a purse snatcher. All part of my modern techniques in crime fighting. Oh, Inspector. There's to the Inspector. A hundred bottles of beer on the wall, a hundred bottles of beer. Take one down and pass it around. Ninety-nine bottles of beer on the wall. Ninety-nine bottles. remain in the pub. Oh, not long, not long. The killer should be coming through that door right about now. Mr. Notch, I am gallery owner Charles Law. I got your message. What message? That you wanted to buy one of my Andy Knight originals. I can let you have this one for a mere thousand pounds. Thousand pounds? <laughs> for this? Tell me, I wouldn't hang that in my loo. It's all the rage now. Since Mr. Knight's suicide, his limited work is in huge demand. Mr. Lord, you know as well as I do, the artist's death was not it was murder. And you killed him. <laughs> Grab him, Notch. Oh, right. Is this some kind of joke? <laughs> I had this case worked out right from the beginning. The Lord was jealous of the artist's talents, so he plotted to do him in. He forced Mr. Knight to write a suicide note. Then he took him down to London Bridge where he shot him and then threw his body into the water to be washed out to sea. I hate to burst your bubble, Inspector, but I'm afraid your theory may not be entirely correct. Is that so, Holmes? And which part do you believe to be in error? All of it. All of it? it? All of it? Sorry, Inspector. Perhaps you should sit down and have another ale. And you should have another round of card playing. A card playing? What are you talking to anyway? He always do that when he drinks. What do you mean? killer was no one. I mean, Andy Knight is still very much alive. But what about the suicide note and the clothes found floating under the bridge? Andy Knight staged his own death in order to increase the value of his... He intended to continue painting while in hiding and sell the pieces as undiscovered works. But if he was supposed to be dead, uh, how could he sell them? 
through his accomplice, gallery owner Charles Lord. Knight and Lord were the masterminds behind this whole plot. That hurt. I realized Andy Knight was still alive from two pieces of evidence. First, there was the painting delivered to the pub. The oil paint was still wet. And second, there was Lestrade's masterly piece of investigation. What was that, Holmes? The fingerprint you lifted from the mud belonging to the stranger sitting next to you. That smudge matched exactly the smudge on the suicide note, indicating that the stranger was none other than the artist himself, Andy Knight. So I did help solve the case. Congratulations, Victor. Perhaps I should start work on my second book on criminology. <laughs> But, uh, but first, I must attend to something of the utmost urgency. What's that, Inspector? W.C. I don't feel at all well. Throughout his illustrious career, Sherlock Holmes has had many distinguished clients, but none so distinguished as the client who employed him in The Adventure of the Ambassador's Retirement. Word, Holmes, I can't believe we've actually been summoned by the Queen. Yes, it'll be good to see Her Majesty again. Again, Holmes? You never told me you met the Queen. You're asked, Watson. Yes, I met Her Majesty years ago during The Adventure of the Winged Man of Tibet. So why on earth she wants to see you now? Oh, undoubtedly to solve the mystery of the ambassador's disappearance. Ambassador? What ambassador? The ambassador to China, Watson. Returning this morning aboard the Peking Duck. Ambassador Longgrave? How do you know he didn't return? Deduction, old boy. If the Queen to consult with us, it must be about a matter of grave concern. So grave, in fact, that she doesn't want it made known to the public. Otherwise, she would have taken the matter to Scotland Yard. The matter must be an international one. And since the only matter of state I am aware of this morning is the return of the ambassador aboard the Peking Duck, I conclude that something has happened to interrupt his arrival and that Britain's tenuous relationship with China must hang in the balance. My word, Holmes. In order to assist the throne, Watson, we must discover A, the whereabouts of the ambassador, B, the motive for his disappearance, C, the crime that has been committed, D, who committed the crime, and E, the international matter involved. Game is afoot. was correct, of course, why the Queen had summoned us. Ambassador Longgraves, due to retire after 35 years of service, disappeared. Holmes and I went directly to the Peking Duck, where we were shown the Ambassador's cabin by Captain Victor Mabry. I say, what a mess! Lord Holmes has been rifled. Captain Maybury, has anyone else come on board in the past hour? Mr. Holmes, as far as I know, we three are the only ones on this boat. Who occupied the cabins on either side of the ambassadors? The cabin on the left uh, was occupied by Mr. Barry Beckworth, the American silk merchant. And the cabin on the right belonged to a dealer in ancient artifacts, a Chinese gentleman named Ling Yang. Oh, excuse me, gents. Mr. Watson. Holmes. What are you two gents? 
Working on a case, eh? That's a very smart cap you're wearing, Rhett. Very much indeed, Mr. Holmes. I'm here to pick up Mr. Beckwith's luggage and take it to the hotel. <laughs> Blimey, <laughs> looks like he ain't finished packing yet. <laughs> uh, Mr. Beckwith's cabin is next door. Oh, much obliged, Admiral. Rhett, when you return to the hotel, would you mind taking this trunk with you? Heavy trunk, Mr. Holmes. But not too heavy for me, Governor. Captain Maybury wasn't sure if he should let us take the Ambassador's trunk. But Holmes told him we were acting on the authority of the Queen. He acquiesced. Well, I do hope you're able to solve this mystery soon, so that I can take my boat back to China for another load of rice. At the hotel, Holmes sent Barnett to find Barry Beckwith, the American silk merchant, and bring him to the lobby. Holmes, would you mind telling me why you brought along this trunk? If you recall, Watson, this trunk was the only piece of luggage in the ambassador's cabin that was not open and not locked. And there is a reason for that. Seems to be a bit of orange silk sticking out. Found Mr. Beckwith on the roof, Mr. Holmes. He said he was trying to catch the sun. Trying to catch some sun, pal. Next month is June. I don't have any color yet. You Americans. What's this all about? Ah, Captain Maybury. I've been expecting you. Have you uh, examined the ambassador's trunk yet? You're just time for the unveiling. Would you do the honours, Rhett? Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Ah! Mr. Ling Yang, I presume. Ah! What is he doing, Holmes? Kung Fu, I believe. Oh. A martial art developed by a special order of Chinese priests. Shaolin, ah! ah! correct? Ah, your most learned Anglo. Then you must know Shaolin Order is dedicated to preserving the culture of China, even death. Let's make this quick, buddy. There's only an hour or so of sun left. <laughs> Kung Fu is all very well, Mr. Yang, but I prefer the defensive art of Akita. As I always say, the best offense, good defense. I thought that was Vince Lombardi. A secret panel, Watson. And what's this? Seeds of some exotic plant, I suspect. Tea? No, thank you, Watson. I must first find out what these seeds are. And what do we have here? They look like little balls of cotton. What are they, Holmes? I assure you, Watson, every one of our three suspects here knows what these are. Suspects? But of what are they suspected? Well, for one thing, incredibly poor taste in clothes. And for another, someone in this room has committed murder. Murder? I must say, Holmes, I haven't a clue what's going on here. Oh, I'm disappointed in you, Watson. This case is virtually rampant with clues. When you discover who was murdered, you'll have the answer to part C. And when you find out who the murderer is, you'll have the answer to part D. The whereabouts of the ambassador, the motive for his disappearance, and the international incident involved are all right and
Incredible, Holmes. The ambassador himself was the criminal. Yes, Watson. Plan was to smuggle silkworms into Europe to create an underground industry that would serve him well in his retirement years. But why did he turn to murder? Well, to allay suspicions about the contraband he was carrying, he decided to cover his plot by murdering Captain Maybury and changing roles with him. But when did you first suspect that the man we met as Captain Maybury was actually the ambassador? Well, not only was he rather pale and unweathered for a sea captain, but he used words like boat when he should have said ship, and left and right when a real captain would have said port and starboard. He even told us that his cargo was rice when we both knew it was tea. So the international matter that concerned the Queen was that Chinese law forbids the export of silkworms. Yes, she'd been alerted that somebody aboard the Peking Duck was attempting to smuggle out the two items necessary for the foreign production of silk. The mulberry seeds and the silkworm cocoons. Precisely. The seeds are essential to grow the only food the silkworm eats. The leaves of the Asian white mulberry bush. The Chinese have been guarding their silk for centuries. <laughs> and charging the rest of the world a pretty penny for it. Well... I'll never look at a silk handkerchief in the same way again. To think these things are the work of tiny little worms. Caterpillars, actually, Watson. Silk worm is a misnomer. By the way, quite a feat for such small creatures. However do they teach them to use those tiny little sewing machines? <laughs> Oh, you finish watching the tape, or else you're speeding ahead to see what's at the end. If you've played all the adventures, I hope you enjoyed solving them. And if you would like to play some more, you're in luck. At this very moment, I'm recording further previously untold adventures of the great Sherlock Holmes. We expect they'll be available at a retail outlet near you in the very near future. Not to give anything away, but be prepared to meet the woman in Holmes's life, Irene Adler. And that diabolical mastermind, the man Holmes describes as the Napoleon of crime, the evil Professor James Moriarty. Well, till the game is afoot again, there you go.